Hello, everybody. I don't know what I did to deserve that, but I will take it. Thank you very much. So many beautiful people in the room. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. And uh, everyone watching online, I assume you're also beautiful, and thank you for being with us as well. Um, my name is Aiden Flax Clark. I work here at the New York Public Library as part of the team that brings you live from NYPL, so I am personally very excited to see all of you in this room. And um, we have a lot to get to tonight, so I'm not going to take a lot of time up here. Um, but I did want to tell you that tonight's event is connect, uh, connected to a very wonderful exhibition that we have upstairs called Treasures. And like its name, that's exactly what it is. It's the greatest hits of our special collections, not only from this building, but also from the Library for the Performing Arts at Lincoln Center and the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in Harlem. And it's really incredible. I like to call it like the ABBA gold of the New York Public Library. It's just like hit after hit after hit. Um, you know, there's the Declaration of Independence in Thomas Jefferson's handwriting. There's the original Winnie the Pooh. For some reason, we have Beethoven's hair. Um, in a very odd little gold box, by the way. Um, Charles Dickens' desk, uh, a Shakespeare first folio, a Gutenberg Bible, it's pretty impressive. And among the many things that are in that exhibition is this painting by Andy Warhol of a ticket to Studio 54 that's inscribed to Truman Capote, which I think you can see up on the screen right now. Um, it's in the exhibition. Now, unfortunately, uh, it's closed today, so you can't go see it, but I very much encourage you to go to nypl.org slash treasures, where you can look at the entire exhibition online, and then when your appetite's been whetted, uh, get a free time ticket and come back and see everything up close and in person, because it's a really, really special exhibition. I think you will enjoy it. Um, and speaking of special tonight, we have uh, basically a one-night-only event that really could only happen here. Um, First, you're gonna learn a little bit more about this painting and about the Truman Capote papers, which is where the painting comes from, which we hold here. Um, and then two amazing actors, Cola Scola and Julio Torres, are gonna read to you from this really incredible, strange, wonderful play, Warhol Capote, um, which is called a nonfiction invention, and it's based on actual conversations between Truman Capote and Andy Warhol that Andy Warhol recorded. Um, after that, I'm gonna talk with the creator of that play, Rob Roth, and um, we've got a lot to get to. Uh, Warhol Capote first ran at ART in Cambridge about five years ago, and next week it's gonna be published as a book, which hopefully you saw over here, and I'm sure all of you have purchased your copy already, yes? I don't think I believe you. Um, if you haven't, there's time to do it afterward, please do. It's just like the play, it is a singular piece of work. It has the entire script, it has a really interesting introduction by Blake Gopnik, who wrote this huge biography of Andy Warhol, it has a great afterword by Rob, a bunch of material that didn't make it into the play. It's really kind of a one-of-a-kind book, I would say. So I really encourage you to get it and have Rob sign it. Um, and of course, it will be available uh, to get from the New York Public Library with your library card, which surely all of you have, correct? I will find you if you don't, and I will sign you up for a library card. Um, we've got a bar in the back. It will be here through the show. Please buy drinks, tip your bartender, get a free snack if there's anything left. And um, we've got a lot to, lot to get to, so let's do it. Um, let me just tell you that the Treasures programming is made possible by the estate of Helen Sisterson, and Live from NYPL is made possible by the continuing generosity of Celeste Bartos, Manaz Ispahani Bartos, and Adam Bartos, and of course by all of you, our wonderful friends and supporters near and far, so thank you very much for your support, and thank you again for being here. Um, okay, so we're gonna start again with Declan Kiley, who is the Director of Special Collections and Exhibitions, and he's gonna tell you a little bit more about this painting and about the Truman Capote paper. So please welcome Declan. Thank you, Aiden. This is the opening paragraph of Capote's 1946 essay, in New York. He was living in Alabama when he wrote this at the age of about 21, maybe 22. It is a myth, the city, the rooms and windows, the steam-spitting streets. For anyone, everyone, a different myth. This island floating in river water like a diamond iceberg. Call it New York, name it whatever you like. The name hardly matters because entering from the greater reality of elsewhere, one is only in search of a city, a place to hide to lose or discover oneself, to make a dream wherein 
you prove that perhaps, after all, you are not an ugly duckling, but wonderful and worthy of love. Nearly 80 years after he wrote these words, the sentiment remains fresh and true and relevant. And it speaks directly to people like me and many others who come to New York City from elsewhere. And while it is unmistakably youthful, idealistic, even romantic in its conception of New York, this brief autobiographical essay contains in crystalline capsule form Capote's lifelong excitement about his adopted hometown. Yet a little further in the essay, we hear the voice of a different Capote, years ahead of himself, and glimpse the future author of Answered Prayers, his last unfinished, posthumously published book for which he was paid fabulous advances. He says, only success, and that at a perilous peak, can give relief. But for artists without an art, it is always tension without release irritation with no resulting pearl. Possibly there would be if the pressure to succeed were not so tremendous. They feel compelled to prove something because middle-class America, from which they mostly spring, has withering words for men of feeling, for its young of experimental intelligence, who do not show immediately that these endeavors pay off on a cash basis. But if a civilization falls, is it cash the inheritors find among the ruins? Or is it a statue, a poem, a play? In part, he's talking about himself and his own creative endeavors here. He would come to know success at its most perilous peak, of course, in the 1970s, when he began to publish stories that included only thinly veiled portraits of his wealthy friends, and in doing so, didn't so much as bite the hand that fed him, as, as the reviewer Ryan Gilby nicely puts it, he gnawed it off at the wrist. <laughs> as well as a genius for making friends, in later years Capote excelled at making enemies of former friends. But Capote took great time and care with his friendships, pouring all of his unmediated personality into his correspondence. Capote even invented a game, IDC, or International Daisy Chain, to energize and enthrall his various correspondents. He said, you make a chain of names, he wrote to his friends in New York, each one connected by the fact that he or she has had an affair with the person previously mentioned. <laughs> the point is to go as far and as incongruously as possible. According to the editor of his letters, uh, Gerald Clark, these combinations were endless, uh, but Capote's favorite chain and the most incongruous of all, was the one that linked Cab Calloway, Calloway to Adolf Hitler. Supposedly, the famous jazz musician and de Fuhrer were, by Capote's reckoning, separated by only three partners. But I digress. Why does the New York Public Library have a painting by Andy Warhol? The painting is part of Truman Capote's literary archive, which was presented to the library after the author's death in 1984, and is now part of the manuscripts, archives, and rare books division upstairs. It's an example of the kind of unexpected artifact that sometimes comprises a writer's archive. Capote and Warhol were both manifestations of the idea that you could come to New York from elsewhere and create a persona or experiment with several personae. Warhol moved to New York from his native Pittsburgh when he was 21 to embark on a career as a commercial illustrator, but he was already aware of Capote's work and sought to connect with him. Alan Schwartz, Capote's lawyer and a personal friend, and subsequently the executor of Capote's estate, has said that Truman Capote had an abiding affection and esteem for the New York Public Library. On many occasions, he mentioned what a valuable and comfortable place it was for young writers, both as a source of research material and as a literary home. Capote's papers, comprising over 17 linear feet of material stored in 39 boxes, include things like handwritten drafts and typescript manuscripts of his works, both published and unpublished. The collection also includes the writer's notebooks, correspondence, printed matter, photographs, artwork, sound recordings, transcripts, and various things in a personal miscellany. The collection spans Capote's entire career, from his juvenilia 
to the book he struggled to complete in his final years, eventually, as I said, posthumously published as Answered Prayers in 1986. And the library continues to add to the Capote collection. Last year, we acquired the only surviving handwritten manuscript and the related typescript of, his most of one of his most controversial works, the story Mrs. Willow's Dinner Party. These newly acquired working drafts represent a unique stage of com com uh, composition, uh, not otherwise present in the archive, and also textually different from the published version in the 1975 issue of Esquire magazine. The story came about like this. In 1973, hearing that Capote was struggling with his much discussed work in progress, Lenore Hershey, editor of Ladies Home Journal, commissioned Capote to write up some of the wicked stories he regularly told her over lunch. He was invited to write up these so-called blind items, true stories with false names, uh, for the magazine, and he did so. Hershey published the first group, but the second batch she deemed just absolutely too scandalous to print. One of these vignettes, Mrs. Willow's dinner party that we acquired last year, included a thinly veiled account of the shooting of William Woodward Jr. by his wife, who mistook him, as Capote says, for some prowler. The fallout of the publication of this story was, for Capote, tremendous and imploded his reputation. Virtually every friend he had in this world ostracized him for telling thinly disguised tales out of school. But even worse, Anne Woodward, the model for Mrs. Peter B. Willows, Anne Hopkins in the published version of the text, subsequently committed suicide and her son also killed himself. Capote's books were bestsellers and with literary fame came celebrity and finally notoriety. Capote, always gregarious, became a party goer. He famously threw his own party at New York's Plaza Hotel on the 28th of November 1966, the so-called black and white ball in, in honor of Catherine Graham, publisher of the Washington Post. It was a masquerade ball, a party at which the attendees wear a costume and a mask. The Stella Gist list was a who's who of New York's glitterati, although Capote later boasted of the event that he'd invited 500 friends and made 15,000 enemies among those he didn't invite. One of the guests at the Plaza Hotel that night was Andy Warhol, who attended the ball unmasked. Despite subverting Capote's strict dress code, the two men remained friends. While Capote's archive does not include any correspondence between them, there are six Polaroid photographs of Capote that Warhol took, um, two in which the author appears in a white hat uh, with a red or white background, um, one with Capote and the supermodel Cheryl Teagues and three Polaroids with Capote and some ident unidentified friends. But I think the artifact that best represents the enduring friendship between Capote and Warhol is this oil painting on canvas, a small and perfect example, I think, of Warhol's pop art. It is not a portrait of the author or the artist. It reproduces a sleek, jet black printed VIP ticket for Studio 54, the famous nightclub where they often party together in the 1970s. On a strip of green tape attached to the back of the painting, you can see it here, uh, Warhol wrote probably with a black Sharpie pen to Truman, Love, Andy, 78, at the very height of their friendship. The painting memorializes the bond of friendship between two very different artists who found themselves living, working, and playing in 1970s New York. To go back to that 1946 essay I began by quoting, Capote later in the essay wrote, wrote this. At night, hot weather opens the skull of a city, exposing its white brain and its central nerves, which sizzle like the inside of an electric light bulb. Warhol's painting of the Studio 54 VIP ticket painted nearly half a century ago, and now on view upstairs in the Treasures exhibition, is redolent, I think, of such hot city nights and radiates some of that same crackling energy. Thank you.
The Crow's Nest at Studio 54. Truman is enjoying a cocktail and looking down onto the crowded dance floor. Andy enters and watches for a few seconds, unnoticed. Then... Hi. Hello, Andrew. How are you? Everything fine? Everybody looks like there's somebody here. Everybody looks so important. Yes. I love your shoes. Oh, they're painted. What? They're painted. Oh, really? Well, I was wearing boots for, you know, six months, and I was getting all these blisters. You probably won't remember, but I think I told you not to wear boots. Oh, I know. Because they weren't good for you, and they didn't look right. Well, I'm back to shoes. Gee. The disco tonight is as good as it was years ago. It is very good. Good-looking people. And straight-looking people. All the busboys are so young now. They're all, they're all so nice. Very good-looking people. <laughs> very amusing. Yeah. Not... Not too gay. It's, it's just great. It, 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 it really is. This is so fun. I don't know why we don't open a nightclub. We'd be good at that. We should open the all-time great disco. I want to do that. And we'd feed everything into it, and we'd make a lot of money. I mean, the idea of just being there is fun. Let's call it something. What do, what do we call it? Hmm... Um, oh, Strange Dance. Strange Dance, yes. Yes, yeah, Strange Dance. That's my favorite name for it. Dance. Strange Dance. Strange Dance. D-E-N-T-S. Strange Dance. Oh, this is fun. This is fun. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll make millions. Millions? Truman... Have you, have you ever been taped before? Sure. The thing I like to do most in the whole world is talk. If I had to choose between writing and talking, well, I, I just don't know what I'd do. You know, uh, just the other day, I was going through the dictionary, and I found the perfect word for you. It describes you perfectly. What's the word? It's called froward. F R O W A R D. Well, what's it mean? Oh, froward is a very marvelous word. It means somebody who's very original and very perverse and contrary wise, something that just doesn't fit. I'm froward, you're froward. Oh, gee. Well, that sounds great. It's a, it's a good title for a book. And nobody ever uses froward. <laughs> Whatever happened to Liza? <laughs> Liza? I think she's starting with Scorsese. Well, he's a big nothing anyway. <laughs> Martin? No, oh, no, 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 no. He... He's, he's actually pretty good. You like him? Yeah, I do, yeah. I mean, he's nice and sweet, but that movie he made with Robert De Niro and Liza has got to be one of the all-time worst films ever. It had good music, and she was good. Oh, you didn't think that. W you thought that was good. No, no, I, 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 I didn't like it. I just like her singing, you know? She's just so good. Mm. Oh, well, Liza's got something. But, you know, and, and, and I love her. She's a really a good girl. But, it, but her mother was one of my greatest friends. And, you know, I knew Liza when she was eight or nine years old. And Liza really actually has talent. Halston told me lots of gossip. Mm. He said that the night before when the doorbell rang, it was Liza. 
Her life's very complicated now. Like she was walking down the street with Jock Halley, her husband, and they'd run into Marty, who she's having an affair with. And Marty confronted her that she was having an affair with Barishnikov. And Marty said, how could she? And this was all going on with her husband right there standing. Halston said it was all true. That he also said that Jack Halley wasn't gay. I was right. I didn't think so. So when the doorbell rang the night before, it was Liza in a hat pulled down so nobody could recognize her. And she said to Halston, give me every drug you've got. Oh. Oh, Liza, she's wise. Oh, she's so fun. Oh, I went to Madison Square Garden to see Elton John. He was sensational, and oh, God, is he fat. <laughs> he had a silver lame caftan, but tight, a skin-tight caftan, and the audience loved it. I went to a David Bowie concert, and um, it wasn't very special. David Bowie never really made that much money. You know, we could have all flown to the Rolling Stones concert in L.A. last night. You mean the night before? Yes, there was this private plane going out, and I started to call you up just for the evening and the concert, and then we would fly back. Do you like traveling with them? Oh, I enjoyed it. I just didn't want to write about it because it didn't interest me creatively. But I enjoyed it as an experience. I thought it was amusing. What was the problem with writing the article? Mm, there has to be some element of mystery to me about it, something that I can't imagine. That was my problem. Since there was nothing to find out, I just couldn't be bothered with writing it. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. And to me, every act of art is the act of solving a mystery. But it seems like there's just so much material on that trip. Yes, there's, there's material, but it's just that, material. It doesn't have an echo, you know? Yeah, yeah. Truman, we should work together. Really? Let's write a new play. We've got to do eight plays on Broadway, all running at the same time. Fast plays. Oh, yes. Broadway. Everybody always says it's dead, it's gone, but it always comes back. <laughs> you know, theaters last year made more money than ever. Gee, Truman, can't I just tape you? You know, the real thing and do plays about real people. Actually, if we just tape it. See, that's the kind of thing that I want to do. Reality and art intertwined to the point that there is no identifiable area of demarcation. And then what do we really talk about? I mean, it will be like a, a small play in which you see everything about a person. Every word of it true. Let's make something, abs some absolutely fantastic thing. I don't think plot is important. If you see two people talking, you can watch it over and over again without being bored. You get involved, you miss things, you come back to it, you see new things. But you can't see the same thing over again if, the plot, if there's plot because you already know the ending. Mm, it, it all has to do basically with truth treated in a fictional form. To see a certain reality about what people are thinking. To see what is going on in their heads and everything. I think it should be a situation comedy. No. <laughs> I know exactly what it should be and I want you to be serious about it. Okay, well, why can't it be a situation comedy? Because it can't be. Oh? Because it's going to be a success. Oh, okay. It's going to be something that's going to run for a very long time. Oh? And be a national institution. Really? God.
A quiet table at Elaine's. Truman takes a very long swallow of his cocktail and puts the empty glass on the table. Are you a jealous person, Andy? Well, I don't, I don't want to be, but I, I guess I am. That's my greatest downfall. That's your greatest downfall? Yeah. It's funny, I work out with these therapists, but I mean, oh, it's ridiculous, it's stupid, it's childish. It's stupid. It's idiotic. I know. Is there a jealous pill? It would be great. It must be a chemical kind of thing. Or do you think people are jealous and some people are I aren't? think it's human nature to be jealous. But of course, it's related to love. I mean, that's all it's got anything to do with. If you get rid of that, it means you're not in love with them anymore. That's certainly the truth with me. You can always tell when the end is coming because I'm no longer jealous. Yeah, that's true. And then you become real good friends because friendship is the perfect sort of trust and belief and not lying to one another. People are, who are having a love-sex relationship are continuously lying to each other because you have to make a love object of this person, which means that you have to editorialize about them. You cut out what you don't want to see. You add what isn't there, and so therefore you're building a lie. Yeah. But... In friendship, you don't do that. You do exactly the reverse. You know, you try more and more to be as completely pure and straight as you can be. I mean, you know, like with Jack, but Jack and I haven't been lovers for now, what, 15 years? But he's still certainly my best friend. If Jack is the magic person, why did you leave him? I, n I never left him. Well, but I, I mean, why did you need other people to, to entertain you? It isn't a matter of entertaining me or something like that. Oh, it is. Well, I just got tired of that same old cock. <laughs> you know, I just got tired of it. Really? Well, how did you meet in the first place? Where, 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 where did you meet? Was it, was it here in New York? He was married to Joan McCracken, who was a friend of mine. Joan McCracken, the dancer? Yes. In Oklahoma? Yes. Was he a dancer? He must have been a raving beauty, oh God. Oh, wait till you see. And Joe McCracken, where is she now? Dead. She died? <laughs> From what? Oh, she married Bob Fosse, and I think that killed her. <laughs> really? God. Anyway, your taste is probably extremely different from mine. My taste? Your taste, I bet, is very different. I'm sure the <laughs> sort of person that you think is attractive with me is zero. Well, I, I, I never do anything, so I mean, no. What? Well, I never do anything. I never do anything. I don't believe you. No, it's true, it's true. I, I never do anything. Well, that's not very healthy. I know, it, it isn't very healthy. That's why I'm having problems. Oh, sex, sex is an awfully strange thing, Andy. I know, yeah, it is. It's always, I'm, I'm just so, I'm, I'm, I'm just so scared. What? I'm scared of people now. I mean, oh, oh no. I mean, I mean, of, of anybody. I mean, my, my, a, 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 a person, you know, I, I just don't, I mean, you know, people take, people take, you, you, you just people so easily. You, you do. You've got some problems. <laughs> I have never been able quite to put my finger on what it is that's bothering you. I don't know. 
Yeah, but but the thing. The th but there's a little kind of curious area there, and I've decided I don't want to know because you don't want anybody to know. I mean, my life's an open book. I mean, I do what I do, and I do this and I do that. And but I, 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 I don't do anything. I mean, I mean, sex is just sort of funny. But that's not right, Andy. It's, it's so wrong. Well, people just kiss and tell. It's so hard. So what do you care? Well, they do. You care? I mean, I don't. I couldn't care less. Well, kiss and tell. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just funny. Well, you're very shy. You're very, very shy, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's all it is. Who did I go to bed with last night, Truman? Nobody. That's right. It's more than I can say. Really? I must say, I had a fantastic sex life. Oh, I used to come home and I'd be so glad to find a little roach there to talk to. At least somebody was there to greet you at home, right? And then they just go away. They're, they're, they're great. Something must be going wrong in your brain somewhere. I mean, sex can't be everything. I mean, sex is only 15 minutes, and the rest of the time you're quarreling with somebody, and you, you, you know, what if that's all it is? The most exciting thing is not doing it. If you fall in love with someone and you never do it, it's just, it's just so much more exciting. Fascinating. <laughs> Blackout. <laughs> How we go. Give it up for Cole and Julio one more time, huh? Hello. And give it up for Rob Roth. And you are uh, in for a treat because there's one more scene after I get to talk with Rob, which will be your first treat. So I guess you're in for two more treats. Um, Hi. Hi, Rob. How are you? I'm good, Eden. Um, this play is so strange and wonderful. Thank you. And, and you created it, but you wrote not a word of it. I did not make up one word of it, no. <laughs> so tell us about that. What's, where did it come from? Um, well, the little section of the play that uh, Julio and um, yeah, Cole read <laughs> just now uh, was actually a little piece of tape that I heard where they said... Andy said, can't I tape you, and can't the tapes be the play? And so when I heard that, uh, I thought, oh my God, they're telling me what to do. And so I did just that. I um, did something that, that I think Andy and Truman both did in their art. I took something real, which in this case was 80 hours of taped conversation, and I filtered it through my imagination, and the play came out, much like Andy took a real picture of a real woman, or used a real picture of a real woman, Marilyn Monroe, filtered it through his imagination, and it came out the Marilyn suite. Uh, and Truman took the real life crime of the Clutter family murder and filtered it through his imagination and wrote in cold blood. So I felt like what they were saying on the tape was true to their art, and the play that they were writing together was going to be follow a, a creative path that they had both followed themselves. Uh, and I'll tell you, it was a pretty crazy moment. I'd been listening to these tapes for maybe a week, and a lot of them were uh, just like at a party, and there were a hundred people talking on the tape, and it wasn't just Andy and Truman, and I was pretty uh, disappointed that it wasn't a play. 
Uh, and then I got to the tape where they were talking about writing the play and, and following this path, uh, which made my hair stand up, and I think I yelled something pretty loud at my husband, Patrick, who came running downstairs saying, are you okay, what's going on? You know? <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was exciting. How did you discover that the tapes existed? Where did they come from? Uh, I'll try to make it short. Uh, Rosie O'Donnell is a friend of ours, and she invited us on a gay family cruise, which is a lovely thing, except I don't like children and I didn't want to be on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> so I just said no. <laughs> and then Patrick, Mistake, mistake. Uh, mistake, yeah. Then Patrick said, oh gee, you know, I'm studying for my medical boards. He's a doctor now, he wasn't then. Um, and I could use a week on the boat to study. So I thought, okay, you know, I'm gonna suck it up and, and go on this cruise. Um, and so I bought a new copy of the Andrew Warhol Diaries, which is my, really my favorite book of all time, written by Pat, ha edited by Pat Hackett. And I've read it over and over again. And it's a good book for a cruise because it's big and long and it has little short diary entries so you can read it in pieces, kind of. And one night in the stateroom, I came across a, an entry and it said, went to Truman's apartment, got six good tapes for the play. And I was like, wait a minute, I, this never landed on me before. And then, you know, it started what's ended up being a 13-year obsession about this. Um, and I had been collecting Andy Warhol penis drawings uh, because it's his private art, what he did for his own uh, well, pri private art collection. And... Um, so I knew people at the Warhol Foundation, including Vincent Fremont, who was Andy's right-hand man for many, many years. And I called Vincent and I said, hey, Vincent, there's this entry in the diaries about play and tapes between Andy and Truman. Do you know about this? And he said, oh, I remember them talking about it, but I mean, you know, they, talked, they were drunk. They talked about a lot of things. <laughs> uh, and I said, well, do you think, you know, is there, where are Andy's tapes? And he said, they're at the Warhol Museum, uh, he gave me a contact there, the, the head um, archivist named Matt Warbican. And Matt said, yes, we have 3,000 more. Jeez. Yeah, 3,000 cassettes. No one's ever listened to them, and we're not allowed to touch them. They're under an embargo. And I was like, what? And he said, I can't explain the embargo. You have to go to the board of the Warhol Foundation. So the Warhol Foundation and the Warhol Museum were two distinct entities. So I called Joel Wax, who's the chairman of the Warhol Foundation, was in, in the day and still is today. And I said, Joel, can I, have, can I look for these tapes? And he said, no. Um, the lawyers, when Andy died, he was recording surreptitiously. And in New York City in the 70s and 80s, that was illegal. And so they have all these tapes, but they were illegally recorded, which leaves the Warhol Foundation open to lawsuits. So they just decided we're going to embargo them till 50 years after Andy's death, which is 2037. So my quest for the tapes was shot down pretty quickly, uh, and I was kind of moping at home, and I thought, um, oh, you know what? Truman knew he was being recorded, because they were working on a play, according to Andy's diaries. So I, I called Joel Walks back, and I said, I don't mean to be a nuisance, but Truman knew he was being recorded. Does that change anything? And he said, you know, let me go back to the board and explore this. And luckily for me, uh, Cindy Sherman, the great photographer, and uh, John Waters, the great filmmaker, were on the Warhol board. And they were very much interested in me pursuing this piece of Andy and Truman artwork. So they convinced the lawyers to let me... Uh, be able to hire uh, Matt Werbican to look at all 3,000 cassettes to see if there was any notation on them that indicated that Truman was on that tape. <clears throat> so Matt Werbican started this process of looking at the cassettes, and he called one day and he said, hey, Rob, it's, it's Matt. You should sit down. And I thought, oh, shoot, you know, he didn't find anything. And he said, I found 59... 90-minute <laughs> <90 minute> cassettes <laughs> that say Truman in Andy's handwriting. And so I got access to those 59 tapes. I paid to have them digitized. 
uh, part of the agreement was that I would pay to have them bonded court reporter transcribed, which means it wasn't like a college kid doing it, it was a real company, and they legally stand behind their transcriptions. And I ended up getting <clears throat> 80 hours of conversation and 8,000 pages of transcript, it was this high. And that was like, uh, well, dream come true, and also, <laughs> you know, daunting, but I started, uh, and I started, I was reading and listening at the same time, and a lot of the tapes, like I said, were Andy and Truman at a dinner party, Andy and Truman at Studio 54. Andy just had the recorder going, in his pocket. So there was a lot of crosstalk, and I only had the rights to use Andy and Truman's words only. So I highlighted or circled areas on the transcripts that I thought were interesting, and I named them. I, they, I called them hunks. So there was a hunk about Liza, there was a hunk about Studio 54, there was a hunk about drinking, there was a hunk about making a painting, you know, and I ended up with 222 cards that represented a topic of conversation, and I kept shuffling the cards, shuffling the cards, shuffling the cards, till I found what I hoped was a format for a play, which I wanted to move from light and funny, which was the, the first scene you just heard, to more personal as the play went on. And because they were great friends, Andy and Truman, and knew each other for quite some time, they were honest with each other. And I think sometimes they forgot the tape recorder was going, hmm. right? And that's where kind of the really great, some of the really great stuff for the play, the emotional stuff came up. Did I answer the question? That's a long answer. <laughs> I think you answered it amazingly. <laughs> Yay! It's, um, I mean, aside from loving the play, one of the reasons I wanted to do this here is because it had so much library, on-brand library, you know, like it, impenetrable it bureaucracy, interminable research in archives, you know, a mountain of paper that you don't know what the hell to do with. It was, yep. it was perfect. Did you feel crazy at all after a while with them in your head? How did it feel, you know, listening to them and thinking about them? And I'm sure the words were popping around in your brain. What was that experience like? Uh, it was wonderful. Uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, the Warhol Foundation and the Capote Trust ha have been amazing. And they trusted me to distill from this mountain of tape and paper um, a true picture of these two men, which I hope that I've done. And um, it felt privileged, I would say. Uh, I'm the only person in the world that's heard these tapes. They're, they're very, very strict about it. They, they don't want them out there. So I'm the only one. My husband, Patrick, had, did hear some of it. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, he's going to be under arrest now. Uh, <laughs> um, and so I felt like I was in their private world, which for a kid who grew up just obsessed with them. I mean, I was obsessed. My parents took me to the Museum of uh, Modern Art when I was young, and I, they bought me a postcard of the flower paintings, and I just remember, it was like a cartoon, but it wasn't a cartoon, and it was flowers, and, and then I saw, saw Andy with the wig and the, you know, uh, and being out at Studio 54 and living a, what seemed to me a very glamorous and exciting life. And I was a gay kid in the 70s, so you're kind of, I knew that I was, but you, didn't, you couldn't really say it then. And then there was Andy, clearly to me a gay man, um, like having the time of his life, like out at Studio 54 and with Bianca and with Liza, and I thought like, this is good. <laughs> you know, this might be fun. And then my parents, um, while, while they're not, voracious readers. They did kind of do bestsellers. So uh, in our library, in our den, we had Valley of the Dolls and The Godfather and In Cold Blood. So um, I was a young reader. And so one night I pulled off In Cold Blood off the shelf and, you know, was immediately, you know, on the high plain wheats of Kansas. You just get sucked into the story immediately. And then my parents were like, you're a little young, I think I was 10, to be reading this. 
<laughs> I'm like, no, 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 it's, it's okay. And then my dad one night said, oh, you know, Truman Capote is going to be on Johnny Carson. You know, you can stay up and we'll watch it. So we watched Truman on Johnny Carson. Um, and it was like, he's someone from another planet, but also hilarious and smart and gay. Uh, and so I just became obsessed with them. I'm a library geek. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to the library and I, started, I read as much of Truman as I could read. Some of it was a little bit beyond me at the time. Um, and then I, I researched Andy and I started seeing all the different kinds of portraiture and the death and disaster paintings. And like, so I grew up loving these two artists, just loving them. So to answer your question, what did it feel like to be having them talking in my head? It felt cool. <laughs> it, it felt, I felt privileged. Um, and it was a, an obsession, but I'm an obsessive person, so like, I like it. I liked it. <laughs> uh, it could have taken a few years less. <laughs> <laughs> to arrive at tonight with, you know, with my book out and, and their words going out to the world, uh, I would have taken like four years off the process would have been better. But, um, well, you but, should have called us four years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, speaking of obsession, one of the things that really shaded the play for me that I guess I wasn't aware of that I'd love to hear you talk about is how obsessed Andy was with Truman mm. from when he was, what, like 19, you yeah. know, when he read Capote's first book. Uh, Andy read Capote's first book, and being the obsessive person he was, stalked him. Like, stood outside his apartment, kind of stalk. Wrote him a, a postcard every day for a year. Uh, so much that Truman got started getting paranoid about it, and sent his mother downstairs, and his, uh, Truman's mother told Andy to, uh, can I say a Please. Word? told him to fuck off. <laughs> um, and um, so, yeah, the, <laughs> um, Andy's first show in New York City was, oh, I might get this wrong. I think it was called 13 Paintings Inspired by Truman Capote's Stories. I got it for you right here. It could have been 14 paintings. Ugh, you're so close. 15 drawings based on the writings of Truman Capote. Yeah, okay, I was close. C plus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but it's just so, when you think about even that first scene where they're gossiping and having fun with them and just the way that the tables have turned and how the tables continue to turn as, as Capote kind of falls apart, yeah. you know, and, and Andy, you know, has his own struggles, but not anywhere near as sort of, you know, uh, life ending, you know. Yeah. The, I mean, in this next scene, this final scene that you're going to hear, um, Truman talks about the trouble living with the kind of brain he has. Um, and I a little bit related to that too. Uh, happily, I'm not as troubled as he was. But I think, uh, and Andy talks about it too in the scene you're gonna hear, making art is, you know, can be painful and hard and uh, you question everything. And I don't know, the, and they were making art at such a high level. And I think the torment that they both felt corresponded to the level of art they were putting out. Yeah, absolutely. A um, couple more questions, and then yeah. we'll hear one more scene. Um, you, you talk in your afterward about how you, as you were putting the play together, struggled with this idea of um, whether you should reinforce the popular sense of who they were or, you know, reveal their true selves. And I'm kind of curious... Um, what, what was the popular sense that you felt you were working against, and what were the true selves that you discovered listening to these tapes? The popular sense of Andy Warhol, which he created, was that he was a robot. Uh, didn't have any feelings, didn't care about anyone, uh, and was a machine, churning out these mechanical canvases. And the perception of Truman Capote was that he was a drunk, that he was, had been talented, but his excesses destroyed his talent. Um, what I found on the tapes were two very, very intelligent, very, very sensitive men who had great respect for one another um, 
I think that the tapes revealed Truman's torment in a way that he hadn't publicly explained in the detail that you're going to hear in this next scene. And Andy really cared, really cared about everything. And his defense against feelings, which I think were overwhelming for him, was to create this facade uh, and a visual iconography of the, wi the silver wig and the, the one word answers and all those things, which really wasn't like him at all. And though Truman is much more verbose in the play than Andy is, because he naturally was, um, Andy talks quite a lot. Yeah. And I think Truman did, um, I don't know if any of you have read The Duke and His Domain. It's, it's a very famous piece by Truman Capote. Uh, it's an interview with Marlon Brando. <clears throat> uh, and I think it was an Esquire in the 50s. And it's a very, very revealing interview by Marlon Brando. It talks about his mother and alcohol and his home life and everything. And when it came out, uh, Marlon Brando was furious at Truman Capote. And Truman Capote later revealed that he got Marlon Brando to talk about all these personal things because in the conversation, he revealed personal things. And it was a, ta a, a tactic he used often in interviewing where he revealed a lot about himself, which elicits a similar response in the person you're talking to. Then in this article, he just deleted his part of the conversation <laughs> <laughs> and left Marlon's. Well, I think a lot of that happened here on these tapes. I, I think that Truman was aware, like, the tape recorder is right there. I'm going to talk about my mother, my brain, my thing, and it's going to elicit something in Andy, which it did. And I think that sometimes they forgot the tape recorder was there. And other times, like, when they were talking about Liza just now, I think they were very aware, like, oh, we're doing a play for Broadway. <laughs> Let's talk about Liza. Let's talk about Halston. Let's talk about, you know, thinking that it was going to make for a good play yeah. and aware that the recorder was there. Uh, and other times, I think they were not aware. So I knew that I had a responsibility to present their real selves. Mm. And I can honestly tell you that though this is completely from my imagination, these conversations happen nothing like this at all. They're pieced together from many different days and different tapes. Um, I stayed true to their intention and true to who they revealed themselves to me on these tapes. So they're honest. Um, and I had the good fortune of having Alan Schwartz, who is the executor of the, uh, Truman's lawyer and the executor of the estate. He's still alive, he's in his 90s. And he saw the play and was extremely moved uh, beyond what I expected. And he said, you know, that's Truman. That, that's his words. It's different than a screenwriter writing his words. And a lot of Andy's friends saw the play and were really emotional too. Uh, and they said, you know, the cadence, the, the way he's talking was him, mm -hmm. uh, rather than someone's interpretation of how he might have been. So I was very pleased about that, and I'm super excited that the book is gonna come out next Tuesday, and the world's gonna hopefully uh, hear from them in a way that the world hasn't heard from them before. Yeah, and that's actually a good time to remind you that the book is out next week, so if you buy it tonight, you are cooler than everybody else. <laughs> um, one last question, then we'll get to the last scene. So, you know, um, you grew up obsessed with both of them, and they always say, never meet your heroes. And in a way, you kind of met your heroes. Yep. Um, so I'm just curious how it changed your relationship to their work and to your, you know, obsession with them. Uh, well, first of all, I would say meet your heroes, <laughs> if you can. Uh, I think I have a little bit of a deeper appreciation for the pain or the, the uh, rather, wait, the cost of making art for the two of them, you know, it's, oh, it really took a lot from them. And it made me feel grateful, too, that I've been lucky enough to make a lot of different art. I've 
directed Broadway shows and concerts and have written this play. And it's cost me emotionally something, but not at that level. And so I was actually glad. Um, like, I felt bad for them that it was, the cost was so high. I mean, it ended up killing Truman. Um, and, you know, I've had a lot of great times making art, including working on this play, which was, you know, I was just happy every day that I got to hear their words and, and, um, and that I was trusted by the two estates as they have been so generous to me. Um, did I answer the question? I don't know if I, I did. I think you absolutely did. And I <laughs> okay. say, let's give it up for Rob Roth, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Okay, so... In a moment, we're going to be joined again by Julio Torres and Cola Scola for one more scene from Warhol Capote. So uh, get ready. And this scene takes place in Truman's apartment. I just want to say, Julio and Cole, thank you so much. Yes, They're so absolutely. awesome. <laughs> All right, it's, thanks. It's everyone. fun to see artists of different um, generation play these two people uh, because their words are true. Um, and so just hearing this, just hearing them just today made me all happy. <laughs> Same. Well, something in life has done a terrible hurt to me, and I think it is irrevocable. I mustn't have anything to drink. I, I mean, well, we all know all of that, but on the other hand, there's a whole other side to that story, too. Yeah. I mean, I can go for a month or two months without drinking, but I, I just got to drink once in a while. I drink because it's the only time I can stand it. Yeah. It's better, actually. It's better that I should drink, but no doctor in the world would ever believe that. <laughs> they would say, oh, no, I mean... You don't drink for two months, et cetera, and then you drink for two or three days, and then they don't understand the sort of nature of the sensibility is what it really is, not the ailment, the sensibility. I mean, something has to be turned off. It's like turning off an extraordinary... Yes, yes. My, my mind is like a fantastic generator it is i know working every minute the machinery is always going even even when you sleep but you know most people's minds are going but 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 and my mind is like an incredible generator i mean it is it's just churning with incredible impressions and images and stories and it has to be turned off once in a while. I know, I know, but, but see... It, it has to be, it has to be turned off in, in some way or another. I know, but, but, the, but the liquor just turns it on and then, and then you It turns it on, but it turns it off. But I mean, it, it's got to be turned off once in a while, otherwise, I mean, it's just It's too... very hard, I know, it's and very hard. The other day, I was lying in bed thinking it's like having a fantastic Ferrari motor running in your head all the time, and then there's speed limits everywhere, you know, and I can't use this thing. And it's like... It's driving me gradually crazy because the thing speeds up more and more and more and more. 
I know. I, 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 I think you could find a drug to stop it a little oh, bit. Oh, I've, I've tried every... No, no, I mean, I mean, eventually you will find the one little thing that would, you know, s slow it down. Hmm. Something just to stop it for a little while. I mean, I, 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 think I, I think I have a really great gift, and I owe it somehow to get it out. And I've been writing for a very long time. I've been writing professionally for almost 40 years. That's a very long time. And a writer can have a long career, but very few of them actually do because it's so nerve-shattering. You're continuously striving and reaching and being miserable and happy and taking drugs and drinking and, and doing something to get out of this ghastly tension because what you're doing is gambling with your life. It isn't reputation. This is your life. These are years gone by, and am I wasting them? Have I totally wasted it? Art is too hard. I'd just as soon have not been a writer if I had a choice. My head is so full of ideas, it's it's a very sort of unusual case that I have. You're, you've got a kind of an, uh, an other thing. You're one of the shrewdest people that I know. No, I'm, I'm not. No, you. Yes, but, but we're talking about you. Yeah, I know, but. No, we're talking about you. I, I'm not. No. I want to talk for one minute about you. Okay. Because you're incredibly clever and shrewd, and it's all disguised marvelously. If I was, I would be, I would be more, you know? I'd be, I'd be, I'd be doing more stuff. No, but it's everything that I'm not. You've got something else, but I don't understand what it is. You're the one person that I don't honestly get. I, get. I get it all the way up to one point, okay? Because I know you're extraordinarily creative. You have a really Im imaginative... Well, that's, that's what it is. I mean, it, it, it's like a, a drop, like a drop in... Well, in, uh, I don't know, in um, blood pressure. It's true. So there's this I incredible drop that suddenly stops you like you were, let's say... But, in... but, but, but then let me explain what the... Where do you... Oh. I'll explain the magic to you. I'll tell you the magic things. I like ideas. It's, well, I, 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 I don't know, really. I'm, I'm trying to do things. If I, if I had only stayed with doing the Campbell soup, because everybody only does one painting anyway, I, do, do, doing it whether you need money is, is, a, is, a, is a really good idea. Just, just that one painting over and over again, which is, which is what everybody remembers for you for anyway. I, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm trying. I, I, I wake up every morning. I, I open... <laughs> I open my eyes and I think, here we go again. I was just trying to do newer ideas and stuff like that. Each, each idea was just something to do. I, and, 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 and you know, it's, it's, it's just that we keep trying. It's just all these nice kids working. I, I mean, you've, you've met them. I think all the kids that work with you are terrific. Oh yeah, there are like 20 right now, but, 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 but we had better ones. We had better ones before. But I think they're all terrific. But the ones we had before were really more imaginative. They, they, they didn't make any money at all. Now, there's a difference, you know, since they're on, since they're on salary. It's, 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 it's a different thing. Before, before I thought all these crazy kids were imaginative. So anybody that was 
peculiar, you know, we, we would have them around. Then, then, then I was shocked. I was shot by Valerie Solanas in the factory in 68. I remember that. I mean, I was just... <laughs> it, it, it made me feel... I, I, I mean, I was, I, it was really terrible. I, I, my, my lungs are still funny from being shot. What a terrible, horrible time. It, it was painful. Do you remember what happened? Oh, yeah. I, I, I had just ridden up in the elevator with her, and I, and, I, and I turned around to make a telephone call and just heard a noise. That's all. My life didn't flash in front of me or anything. I, 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 just, I just never think about it. Mm. Insane bitch. <laughs> After that... I stopped seeing creepy people. I, I, don't, I don't see imaginative people anymore. I, 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 it brought back memories of getting shot. I, 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 I got scared. Well, of course. Now, 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 they're not allowed in the door if they're peculiar. So, 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 so we're not that creative anymore. They're, they're, they're not. I'm not. I don't, I don't have strong feelings on anything. I, 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 I just use whatever happens to be around for me, for, for, for my material. I, 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 I just do anything anybody asks me to. You have to be a business. It all just stops being fun. And then you wonder, what, what, what is art? Does it, does it really come out of you? Or is it just a product? I, 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 I should have done the Campbell soup and just kept doing them. It's, it's very complicated. You know, you, you know what I mean. Andrew, you are a sterling fellow, and no one ever said differently. The, the world fascinates me. I feel that I understand you, really. I know so much better about you than you know about yourself that you just wouldn't even believe. I have so much affection and feeling. And you know how much I love you, right? I care about you more than you know. God. Well, thanks. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, gee. Give it up one more time for Julio Torres, Cola Scola. Here and thank you again for coming.